Hey guys, Buildzoid from Actually Hardcore Overclocking here. Today we're going to be taking a look at the RX Vega Strix Edition from Asus. This is the first of the Vega custom PCB cards, and this one is surprisingly good, which honestly, it, in some sense, you know, I shouldn't be saying that because Asus do make a point of generally not putting out subpar PCBs, or at least not PCBs worse than the reference design. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our coffee lake temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like Cryonaut and Hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. With the sort of Frontier Edition PCB and the reference PCB for all the Vega cards being so ridiculous, because like, that PCB is on par with, say, the 290X Lightning. Um, I, you know, I, I was thinking it would be pretty hard or very expensive for manufacturers like Asus, Gigabyte, uh, and all the rest um, to actually manage to produce a PCB better than the reference design. Or, you know, if they, like, do they actually care um, to produce a PCB better than the reference design? So. Asus have actually gone ahead and made made some pro, uh, some improvement. They have still kept it a 12 plus one phase VRM design, uh, so 12 phase V core and uh, one phase for the HBM. So exactly the same as the reference card. The V core VRM is actually made up of two blocks of phases, so you end up with this kind of weird layout. Which, if you've seen the reference cards, then this isn't that surprising. It's still an L shape, except it's further away from the GPU core. Um, and it's not completely wrapped around it. So, uh, you know, it, it's slightly different layout. It's a bit further. That could increase a voltage drop across the power plane to the GPU core, which, you know, the voltage controller can compensate for that, in which case it's just a little decrease in uh, VRM efficiency because you're burning some extra power on the actual power plane itself. Um, the benefit, though, to this sort of more spaced out VRM design that the Strix is taking is that this should be a lot easier to cool, as this VRM has a lot more surface area and a lot more copper to it, as in you literally have just all this copper up here, which, you know, it is it is covered in a bunch of PCB masks, so it's not the best, uh, not the best heatsink ever, but it's still better than nothing. So... And the same goes for the power planes themselves, as well as, you know, just all the extra area that this VRM gets, uh, which I imagine was done by Asus in design specifically to try and improve uh, VRM cooling for the card. Um, so that's the vCore VRM layout. Now, below that, you find the HBM VRM, which that's the single phase. And that's exactly the same as the uh, reference design as well, in terms of how many phases it has. Uh, you also have on the PCB these three uh, minor rails, and this should be the auxiliary, so that's the memory controller voltage. Um, this sits typically at 0.9 volts. Then above that, you find the, which, well, I'm not actually sure which of these is what, because I do not have the card in hand, but I'm going off of what a Frontier Edition or a reference uh, Vega 64, Vega 56 PCB would have here, and the layout, because Asus haven't really changed what is where, um, as the vCore VRM is still in the general area of where the vCore VRM is on the reference card. The HBM is basically in the same place, relative same place as on a reference card, so I assume these also didn't change places. Uh, in which case, this one up here is the VPP, so this is a supporting voltage for the HBM. Uh, it sits at 1.8 volts, and it does basically nothing for overclocking. You do not have to worry about that. And above that, you have Display Drive, which, again, does nothing for overclocking. On some past generations of AMD cards, the Display Drive voltage could help with black screen issues when running liquid nitrogen. Uh, Vega has zero issues at very low temperatures. It actually really, really likes them, except for the part where the driver currently doesn't let you set clocks high enough to max the card out at low temperatures. So, yeah. But nonetheless, uh, those are the three minor, uh, three minor VRMs on the board, and they're not really that important. I just point them out because because more details, more better, obviously. Anyway, let's move on to the details of the things that actually matter, the vCore VRM. And Asus did actually manage to make a slight improvement over the reference design. 
um, while keeping the exact same phase count. And the difference is all down to the MOSFETs, or in this case, power stages. The reference design uses International Rectifier Direct FETs, um, a 6894 and a 6811. This right here uses international rectifier power stages. These are the IR 3555Ms. These are 60 amp power stages from international rectifier. They're pretty much the second best power stage that international Re rectifier makes. Asus loves using these. They use them on a bunch of motherboards. They use them on a bunch of GPUs. Actually, they use them on like all their GPUs that are higher end. Um, and they are really nice power stages. So the end result of actually this choice of power stage on this card is that in comparison to the reference PCB for 1.2 volts output, 300 kilohertz switching frequency, and an assumed, um, because again, I do not have the card in hand, I can't check, um, but I assume this card runs uh, seven volts gate drive, um, because if it runs 5 volt gate drive, then actually there's no improvement over the reference design at all. But if it does run 7 volts gate drive, um, then this VRM is capable of pushing 200 amps at 18 watts of heat dissipation, which is the same as a reference PCB. 300 amps, so this is where normally a Vega BIOS, this is the normal Vega BIOS current limit. Um, so 300 amps, it can push at about 25 watts of heat dissipation. This is actually about 9 watts better than what the reference card can do uh, for 300 amps current output. 400 amps, you're looking at about 42 watts of heat output, um, which is again about uh, 11 watts better than the uh, reference design. 500 amps. You, this card does at 65 watts, the reference design would do at about 75 watts. So, you know, it is a small but constant improvement over the reference design in terms of uh, VRM efficiency as it doesn't put out as much heat um, as the reference design would. And this maxes out at a whopping 720 amps theoretical, as long as you can keep the VRM at, well, below 125 degrees centigrade. Well, you could go higher than that, but really you, you shouldn't go above 125. So you don't want to measure the uh, anywhere in the VRM area being over 125 degrees centigrade. It could push 720 amps. However, the VRM would at that point produce about 135 watts of heat, um, which is quite frankly uncoolable. I mean, even this 65 watt figure is going to be an issue to cool. Um, so that 135 one is purely theoretical. But that is the theoretical limit if you put a big enough heatsink on this VRM and say a delta fan for airflow. So yeah, it is a it is a you know it's not a massive improvement over the reference design. It's not necessarily gonna change the if you were running this card and the reference design on liquid nitrogen. I imagine you probably wouldn't see any difference between either of them as this is roughly ten watts more efficient than the reference design. So. You know, it's not not a huge difference there, but it is um, it is a small improvement. And, you know, the X-ray efficiency for, for basically for free is all I imagine a welcome thing for anybody using Vega, even if it's like 10 watts compared to a reference card, which really isn't such a huge difference. So, yeah, um, the V-Core VRM definitely I have no complaints about. It's still a 12 phase. Um, and, you know, I could say, yeah, maybe they should have gone for a 16 phase, except the thing is, um, with the voltage controller that uh, AMD requires for Vega, which is this chip right here, and that chip is an IR35217, um, this is a 6 plus 2 phase voltage controller maximum. You can't actually run uh, more phases than 6 plus 2 out of it. So basically for any PV, uh, PCB, well, any manufacturer of GPUs, using this voltage controller basically means that they can only do uh, VRM designs like 12, uh, which would be 2 times 6. Um, as this VRM is obviously using doubling, you can't buy a 12-phase voltage controller. And in this case, the doubling is done by these chips right here. Those are IR3599s. They're really not that, like, these aren't anything intelligent. They literally just take a PWM uh, signal and send every other PWM pulse to the alternating phase. So, you know, one time, one 
so in 12, um, okay, you know what? I think you got it the first time. I'm not going to bother trying to explain how the, how it interleaves the signal, but basically, uh, it also does cut the switching frequency in half. So the 35, uh, 35217 would be pushing out, say 600 kilohertz to the 3599, and that would then push 300 kilohertz to the two phases in front of it. So something like that for each of them. But anyway, um, the VRM setups basically are restricted to say 12, which is a two times six, or a 16, which would be a four times four. This would actually be problematic. This could arguably end up with worse voltage, re uh, voltage regulation results than the 12 phase and worse efficiency than the 12 phase. Because if you're running a four, uh, because at that point, the 35217 isn't seeing a six phase VRM, it's seeing a four phase, and it would be running all 16 phases like they're four. So you could end up in situations where like one out of the 16 phases is taking way more load or very little load because the voltage controller has very little control over balancing them all. Um, ultimately, any large, you know, doubled up phase design is going to run run into that issue as well. But at least you'll have, you know, at least you'll have groups of four, more groups of four balanced properly instead of just four groups of four ba balanced properly because it does end up just averaging all four phases together and sees them as one single big phase. Um, so that, that's a bit of an issue. So you're stuck with like a 16 phase, which is less than ideal, or a 20 phase, which that shouldn't be, um, or a 20 phase, which would be a four times five, which wouldn't be that much worse than a, you know, that would are probably always end up being better than a two times six. But that's 20 phases. That's really expensive to implement. It takes up a ton of PCB space and nobody's going to bother with that. It's just not worth it. And then finally, you could also go for a 24 phase. But, you know, if the 20 phase is expensive and ridiculous, why would anybody do a 24? So I'm really, really not surprised. We're, we're probably going to see all the Vega cards using 12 phase VRM designs. I'm hoping that they all use 12 phase VRM designs. I hope nobody goes below that because that would be a problem. But, you know, I really doubt we're going to see a Vega with more than 12 phases just because the next step up that makes kind of sense with this voltage controller is 20 and 20 doesn't make sense. It's too many phases. So, yeah. Um, that, that's a kind of unfortunate situation for Vega. If it wasn't stuck competing against a 1080 Ti, I sure, I'm sure that we could see something like a, you know, 20 or 24 phase VRM equipped, uh, Vega Lightning Edition or, you know, Matrix Edition, some crazy LN2 overclocking card. But as it stands, the 1080 Ti is just better in the competitive overclocking scene. So nobody's going to bother with some ridiculously overbuilt Vega card. Um, not that that's much of an issue as the 12 phase will be almost like the current VRM for Vega, the reference one is already plenty. Um, and even this marginal improvement just means more plenty. So I'm not really that disappointed that we won't be seeing, you know, more overkill. Um, though 12 phases isn't really overkill. It's just kind of enough as Vega does get ridiculously power hungry once you start pushing the card. Um, the HBM VRM is a, you know, it's still a single phase. This could be a two phase. I don't see the, like, I, I don't see a problem with keeping it a single phase. Um, because the HBM2 really doesn't pull that much power from this VRM anyway. Um, it's going to be in the range of maybe 20, possibly 30 amps at 1.35 volts. You know, it's very low current. It doesn't, you know, you don't need two phases. And ultimately, the HBM currently clocks great. Um, I've also tried extra capacitors on my own Vega cards for the HBM VRM. Uh, they haven't made a single, uh, like, they didn't make a tiny amount of difference. Um, no improvement in overclocking range basically tells you that the single phase HBM VRM is plenty in terms of uh, voltage regulation to get the uh, clocks as high as they can go, at least without raising uh, HBM voltage. The only issue is raising HBM voltage is really risky as historically HBM has been very, very sensitive to voltage and degrading very rapidly at higher voltages. 
as 1.4 volts only took a few months to degrade the HBM1 on a Fury X. So uh, overvolting HBM2, I wouldn't really recommend either. And so I don't see a problem with the single phase VRM design here. Um, as you know, there's not, there wouldn't really be any benefit to a two phase. Um, now for that 20 amps, uh, current output, the VRM would produce about 1.7 watts of heat, again, assuming 300 kilohertz switching frequency and 7 volts gate drive, and at 30 amps, it would produce about 3.2 watts of heat. So, yeah, yeah, it's negligible amounts of heat. You don't really have to worry about this VRM either. No issues here. So, ah, that's, that's the card in terms of the VRMs, and, you know, Good on Asus for actually making some improvement over the reference design because the reference design was already really nice. This is slightly nicer. It's a little bit more efficient. Um, not a huge amount, but, you know, every little kind of helps. And they did also make some uh, nice additions to the PCB, but not one of them. Uh, the card does still have a dual BIOS switch, which means if you buy a Vega 60, uh, I mean Vega 56 Strix edition, um, flashing a Vega 64 BIOS will be pretty much risk free as if you screw up the flash for whatever reason, you can use that BIOS switch to recover very, very easily from the, uh, from the, uh, you know, failed flash. Now, one addition that Asus has made to the card, which is kind of cool, um, ignoring of course, all the fan headers and I assume RGB headers and more RGB headers, um, is these over voltage points up here. Um, these are really like, I'm not sure if they're enabled. They probably require some extra soldering elsewhere on the card as that's usually what Asus does for these to make sure that, you know, um, you can't really use these without some specific information from Asus about how to use these. But ultimately these allow you to, based on their uh, descriptions, uh, raise core voltage, memory voltage, so that'd be the HBM, and the VC, OVCI, so that should be the VDDCI, so that would be the auxiliary voltage over here. This is really helpful because as of right now, the software voltage limitations for Vega are far too low for anybody running, say, well, um, if you're running water cooling, I think you're still probably going to want to stay with with under 1.3 volts. But if you go on something more extreme, like say dry ice, liquid nitrogen, uh, you're going to be looking at voltages like at least 1.35 volts, and they massively help the card. Like this card loves the extra voltage, um, even on air cooling uh, and water cooling. The card does benefit from extra voltage. It's just a case of it gets really, really, really inefficient in terms of power consumption. It just burns like, you know, everybody already says Vega is power hungry at 1.2 volts. Once you start cranking up the voltage, these cards will very quickly exceed, say, 500 watts power draw on the eight pins. So yeah, you know, cool for extreme overclockers, not really useful for any other usage. Um, so yeah, that's it for this uh, PCB breakdown. Thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe. Leave a comment down uh, below if you have any questions or, well, thoughts. And please support Gamers Nexus on Patreon. If you would like to see more videos like this, you can uh, head over to my channel called Actually Hardcore Overclocking, where I do PCB breakdowns and a whole bunch of other extreme overclocking related stuff. That's it for the video, and goodbye.